Hello and welcome to Make It Big 2022, our fifth annual conference. I'm Brent Bellum, CEO at Big Commerce, and I'm joined today by the legendary John Mackey, co-founder of Whole Foods Market. And in the 44th and final year of your long run heading this amazing company. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing well. You, you, you didn't necessarily have to emphasize final quite so powerfully. As we record this, you've got months to go and then some great hikes to do after you're done, right? I do, and other businesses to begin. I love it. All right, I want to hear more about that at the tail end of this. So as an introduction, John started Whole Foods Market as a single store in Austin, Texas in 1978 and has turned it into a Fortune 500 company, which went public in 1992 and was purchased by Amazon in 2017. Today, Whole Foods Market is a top U.S. supermarket with more than 500 stores and 95,000 team members across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. John has been recognized as one of Fortune's world's 50 greatest leaders, Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year overall winner for the United States, Institutional Investor's Best CEO in America, Barron's World's Best CEO, Market Watch's CEO of the Year, Fortune's Business Person of the Year, and Esquire's Most Inspiring CEO. You may also be familiar with John as the co-founder of Conscious Capitalism Movement and author of the best-selling book, Conscious Capitalism, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business, which we will discuss in more detail later in the segment. On a personal note, John, I want to thank you for feeding me from 2010 to 2015 when I worked just across the street from your global flagship headquarters grocery store. It was my cafeteria probably 500 or more times. And I also had the pleasure in 2012, right when you came out with the book Conscious Capitalism, of coming across the street, listening to you talk personally about the book, and that was the first time that I ever saw you in person. So you took very good care of me for many years. Uh, Brent, you look, you look like a very healthy, fit guy. You're lean. Clearly, you're eating. Uh, Good food, and I'm happy you've eaten some of it at Whole Foods. Thank you. So much superfoods, I, I, I owe a lot to that. John, recently you announced your impending retirement later this year after a remarkable 44-year run that has in many ways transformed not just grocery retail, but how America eats, how they think about their place in the food ecosystem, and how they think about their grocer within their community. It's an incredible legacy and impact. Thank you for all of that. Oh, thanks, Brent. I'm, I'm honored to, be in, to have been invited. Thank you. Right on. Let's get started with your story. Tell us how it all happened back in 1978 right here in Austin, Texas. How did you get started? Ah, well, it's always a question of where do you start the start. <laughs> and I guess I'll start it when I was about 23 years old a student at University of Texas. I went back and forth between Trinity and, uh, and San Antonio and UT here in Austin. And I moved into a vegetarian co-op. It was a, a cooperative living arrangement. I, I, I wasn't vegetarian at that time, but I just thought I'd meet very interesting people in a vegetarian co-op. And that was a life-changing decision for me. Once I moved in there, I had my sort of food consciousness awakened. I learned about natural and organic foods. I learned how to cook. I became the food buyer for the co-op. I uh, went to work part-time in a natural food store, and I was so on fire about healthy living, healthy eating, um, that what you ate actually affected your health, your longevity, your energy levels. That was all like revelatory for me back in that day. And then once I woken up, I woke up to my own pur higher purpose in life, which is to promote those things. And I remember I, went, I was working at that small natural food store called The Good Food Company back in 1977, and there were about, they had about five little tiny stores. And, and I'd figured it out, and I remember coming back to the co-op and, and talking to my girlfriend, Renee, and I said, Renee, what do you think about if we opened up our own natural food store? And she loved that idea. She was so enthusiastic. Renee was a very positive, enthusiastic person. And fortunately for me, because if she'd said that is a really stupid idea, then chances are that would have that would have been the discouragement I needed to not do it. But she loved the idea, and so then we began to 
we decided to do it. And the first thing is every entrepreneur knows you have to know what you want to try to create, but you also have to have some money to do it. And I was 23, Renee was 19, and we, we had no idea uh, what we were doing. But we hustled our families, we hustled our friends, and we raised $45,000. And we opened up our first store literally about uh, a quarter, between a quarter and a half a mile from where we're sitting right now wow. uh, in, a, in an old Victorian house. And it was called, and we named the first store Safer Way. It was meant to be a joke about Safeway, Safer Way. And we had a, we had a grocery store, natural food store on the first floor. We had a vegetarian cafe on the second floor. Renee was also a vegetarian. And we had a, we lived on, we lived on the third floor. We had an office, but we also had a futon couch that we could fold out at night and we slept there. And, and uh, it was an adventure, but we didn't know what we were doing. This was not a high traffic area. And Saferway did manage to lose half of its capital in its first year. We lost $23,000. But we, <clears throat> I'm a fast learner. I'm reading hundreds of business books. I'm getting my, I never took any business classes while I was in college, but I was studying this stuff like crazy. And we managed to eke out a small pro profit in year number two of $5,000 with Renee and I taking $300 a month each uh, while living in the store. You didn't need too much. And I realized, oh my God, we're at a competitive disadvantage. We're the small little store in this little side street. We got co-ops are bigger competitors. Good Foods is a bigger competitor. We're going to lose. And I did not like the idea of losing. So I said, we need to have a bigger location. At that point, we merged with another competitor natural food store, another small store like mm -hmm. ours that we were friends with because we were the small little independents going up against the, the co-op, the co-ops and the good food company. Um, and so we um, founded that first location uh, also just about a half a mile from here or even less at 10th and Lamar. That first store, first Whole Foods Market was so successful, it became the highest volume natural food store in the United States within, wow. within just about six months. And it was, um, it was phenomenal. You know, we did get our, our beer and wine department, we did get our meat department, and uh, it just, Austin loved it. It just, it was just crazy. We were doing $200,000 a week, that would, in a, a little 11,000 square foot store, that'd be equivalent today to about $800,000 a week. And that was a lot of sales back then for any kind of grocery store. So then Austin had its big flood, and that's what led us to get a second store. We built that first store in the 100-year flood zone. So we knew about once every 100 years the store was going to flood, and it happened to flood in our first year. It was your first year first that year. happened? Yeah, wow. first year for Whole Foods Market. And we, Now in the book, just pause on that. Yeah. In the book you talk about how you thought you were bankrupt. You didn't have the money we to rebuild. We were bankrupt. Stakeholders it, saved us. And your customers came in and saved you. All the stakeholders did. I mean, I didn't have the language for stakeholders back then. Just, they were just like our constituencies. Uh, our, our, our customers, at the day after the flood, lots of customers showed up to help us clean up the store. They were, they were, as, they were as distraught as we were. Um, we didn't have flood insurance, which you have to get from the government. We didn't even know that, you, we didn't know anything about that back then. We were just kids. And we, um, our team members worked for free. It took us 30 days to get the store back open again, and we weren't sure we could pay them, but they were willing to work, and the idea that we would be able to pay them. Our suppliers fronted this new inventory. Our bank gave us a, a, a $100,000 loan on my signature, which very interestingly, I just found out a few years ago that the bank actually turned that loan down. The banker personally guaranteed the loan. Wow. Because he said he knew I would pay him back. If it took me the rest the of my individual life. did. The individual said, I knew you'd pay me back, and so I bet on you. And he's right, I would have paid him back, even if it took take me the rest of my life. Hmm. And so uh, we had all the stakeholders coming together to basically, like a phoenix, rise this broken business How back up. How is it that only one year into business, your stakeholders, your employees, your customers, the folks who financially backed you care so much about your business that they helped to save you when a flood otherwise would have wiped you out only one year into business it's a good question i can't know for sure what the answer is uh, i'd say they did it because they loved us they loved what we stood for we had a higher purpose 
They stood for the fact that they'd never been in a store like ours before. They, we were one of the very first natural food supermarkets in the history of the world. And it was new, it was different, and people loved it. I could ask a thousand questions, but I'm curious from that origin story, what was the what was the best thing that you or Whole Foods Market did to go from founder created one or two stores to hundreds of stores in a public company? What was there an inflection point or a decision that was essential for you to be able to take this into really a leading grocery retailer in the US? I think there were a number of inflection points. So there over that history to get to where we were. Um, if you want to ride a big wave, you got to get into a place that's producing big waves. Mm -hmm. And and we were fortunate in that the world was ready to make this shift. And Whole Foods partly created that shift, but we were also very much, um, our success was partly the fact that people were ready for that shift. And we saw that earlier than other people. So any type of entrepreneur needs to innovate in, in, in ways that were ahead of the time. If you just, if you see something everybody else sees, then you're really not innovating anything. You're just a follower. You don't have first mover advantages. You oftentimes, you're just not gonna be as successful. Sometimes it happens, but most of the time, the people that follow just don't, they don't, they don't optimize at the highest levels. So it helps a lot that we had a, we were in a time when it was ripe for this to happen. Other type inflection points for us, remember we were a bunch of young people who really didn't know what we were doing. And that meant we didn't know how things were supposed to be done, mm. which gave us tremendous opportunity to innovate in unusual ways. So we were, none of us that created this company ever worked in a day in their lives in supermarkets. So they didn't know how supermarkets did it. So we reinvented the wheel sometimes. It's like we made discoveries that, you know, the supermarket industry had known for decades. But we also were free to invent in ways that we were not limited by industry think. So that enabled us to completely think out of the box all the time. And from the way we designed our stores, we didn't do cookie cutter stores. We Almost everyone was kind of a custom home, a little more expensive, but it an, allowed us in every new store to be innovating and creating a different kind of customer experience than they'd ever had before, and also customizing our stores for the market we found ourselves in. Wonderful. Let's touch briefly on e-commerce, because after all, we're an e-commerce company, business. and our customers are, are all in that. When did Whole Foods Market begin selling online, and how has that evolved since then? We really got going back when the first dot-com boom was occurring. Um, I don't know. 2000 if, or so? Yeah, 1999, 2000. We started up WholeFoods.com. I mean, I drank the Kool-Aid. You, I realized, oh my God, this internet's amazing. It's going to change everything. I, I, I got that quickly. Entrepreneur, right? You see opportunities, mm -hmm. and I thought, man, we don't want to be left behind. It was back in the day. You better get into this now. You're going to be left behind. That was kind of the the kind of the overall environment that was out there, and so we got into. We opened up WholeFoods.com, and then we decided, you know what? Selling a little bit of food online, it's expensive. Shipping's expensive. How do you sell a can of beans online? The shipping costs kill you. So then it was like, we could be a lot more than that. Right. But we started selling supplements. We started selling books. We started selling all kinds of clothing. We started selling all kinds of things online. But back in the year 2000, the only people that were shopping online were a bunch of tech geeks. And they were mostly looking for free stuff because so much of it, you had you know, drugstore.com and pets.com and you had all of these, every, every, taking generic names and putting a dot com on it was, the, was all the thing. So we changed our name to wholepeople.com. We raised venture capital money on a separate, uh, and as a separate business uh, and we raised 30 million dollars. Everything that we were doing, there was nothing, today you can buy stuff off the shelf for, for practically nothing. Back then you had to build everything from scratch and it was expensive. You, you do some projections on it and it's like, this, we're gonna run out of money here and before long. Our Whole Foods market stock price was getting killed. This whole idea of having a hybrid concept back then was no. You were a pure play or you were dabbling in something you shouldn't be dabbling in. And our stock price was getting punished. There was a lot of pressure from our board to do something. So we decided to sell out 
what we had and get out of that business. One thing I can tell you about being a successful entrepreneur is you, you climb a wall of doubt and skeptics, all telling you why it's not going to work. And then when people look back on it, it seems so obvious, right? I mean, it's like, well, duh, anybody can see that. But people, the art of it is to see it before other people see it, act on it with great conviction and passion, and develop a business that gets out in front and can continue to grow. And that takes, not only takes vision, it takes some courage. Because you have to be willing to scale that wall of skeptics and doubters and pessimists, people telling you all the reasons why it's not going to work and what can go wrong, and you still go for it anyway. Yep. And uh, those that do, you know, I mean, Jeff Bezos reaped a pretty good prize, Bill Gates. Look at Elon Musk, who believed, you know, I own a Tesla, and I, that car is by far the best car I've ever owned. There's nothing that's ever close to it. And, but if you told me before, you know, when EVs were first coming out, I was very skeptical. It's like, electrical vehicle, they tried that stuff a long time ago. It doesn't work. It's too expensive. You're not, not going not gonna to get any range on it. But a visionary entrepreneur like Elon Musk, now he's the richest man in the world. He's the richest man in the history of the world. Right. So it's having that missionary zeal behind your concept that doesn't let you... And the, doesn't let and, you... and the passion to not let your business fail. Yeah. Because even Elon Musk almost failed. He tells this story where he, I think he almost went begging to Tim Cook to put some money in. The t and it was only like four or five years ago. They were almost bankrupt, and now they're, they're, you know, every car maker out there is trying to do EVs now because of what Tesla's accomplished. It's an incredible story. All right. So first effort at e-commerce is a flop. Yeah. Um, we don't have to go through what happened after yeah, that. How no. important is e-commerce today? The, the answer is, market? for a long time, nothing happened after that. It was mm. the scars were deep, and, 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 and the CEO kept vetoing everybody that come to him and say, let's do some e-commerce stuff. Yeah. But so there was a long gap between that, and so we're talking about, we probably got back into e-commerce after we got out of it in 2001, and we didn't get back into it through Instacart until about 2015. Yeah. What do you think it'll be 10, 20 years from now for grocery retail? The efficient model would be to set up dedicated small distribution centers that would serve a market. They could do it far more efficiently than an ongoing supermarket could do it. And you can do it in areas that have lower, you know, we locate Whole Foods markets in good retail locations, which are expensive. You can do it in warehouse locations, which are not nearly as expensive. So that'd be a far better way to yeah. do it. So if you're asking that question in, in the future, in the future, I don't think people will be buying most of their food for delivery from existing supermarkets. Yeah. I think that's just like, it'll transition away from that to models that are far more effective at picking, packing, and delivering. All right, let's switch now from e-commerce to conscious capitalism, which was a book you, uh, well, it, among other things, it's a movement. It was a book that you co-wrote in 2012, and I encourage everybody who's interested uh, in it from this introduction to go read the book. It's uh, a lot to be gained for, I think, any person who works in American business. Could we start by just summarizing the concept of conscious capitalism? Conscious capitalism in itself is a pretty simple thing. It's, uh, it's recognizing that business, every business has a potential for a higher purpose beyond just making money. And it, to me, that's sort of obvious, but to other people, it's not obvious. But if you think about it for a minute, Brent, um, every profession in the world refers to some type of value creation for customers. They all have a higher purpose. Yeah. So if you're a, a doctor, your purpose isn't to make money. Your purpose is to heal people. If you are a teacher, you educate. If you're an architect, you design things. If you're an engineer, you construct things. So all of these refer back to some type of value creation for customers. Business is put in this narrow box. Is the purpose of business to make money? No, no, it's not. That, that might be the purpose of the investors in the business, but the business itself's purpose is value creation for customers. It's true of all businesses. And so to, if you want to know what your higher purpose in your business is, ask what your value creation is, and then ask if that value creation is potentially even bigger than you realize, so that uh, it can even, it can, you can, it, you can, you can magnify it to a higher level because you're not just 
making widgets, you're creating value for people, and how could you create additional value for people? So the first is every business has the potential for a higher purpose. That's the first pillar of conscious capitalism. The second pillar is that all stakeholders matter, particularly the primary stakeholders, the ones that are voluntary exchanging with the business, customers, employees, suppliers, investors, and then the communities that we're part of. Uh, and so once you realize they all matter, and you also realize they're interdependent. So a simple example is in a food store like Whole Foods, um, management's job is to hire the very best people we can find, make sure they're well-trained and highly motivated, and then their job is to go serve the customers. And then if they do, if they serve their, if they serve the customers well, then, uh, well, the management's job is to make the team members happy, and if they're happy, they serve the customers better. And the customers serve, are, are well served, that makes the investors happy. So you have this interdependent cycle. That's a, a simple model, but it's true. All the stakeholders are interdependent, and once you understand that, you can manage your business more consciously to create value simultaneously for all of these stakeholders. And that you will basically optimize your business at a higher level with, with positive uh, uh, spirals of, of advancement occurring because all the stakeholders are happy and, and you're managing in such a way that they're all succeeding. Third pillar, conscious leadership. Leaders should be in service to their businesses. They should serve. It's not about ad, uh, trying to aggrandize their own wealth and power, which oftentimes it turns out to be for many people. Uh, finally, I'm the CEO. Now I'm going to make big bucks and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive this business I only got about seven years before they're going to re replace me, so I'm going to make as much money as I can. No, conscious leaders are serving the higher purpose of the business because they are personally aligned with it. And secondly, they are serving all the stakeholders to try to optimize this business at a higher level. Yes, they will also prosper if that occurs because it should be a win-win-win relationship. But it's not about themselves. It's primarily about the service they do to the, to the business itself. And, and fourth is a culture that allows human beings to flourish. We spend a lot of our lives working a lot in our businesses, and people need to be fulfilled. I'm proud of the fact that Whole Foods was named one of the 100 best companies to work for for 20 consecutive years. Wow. We've always cared about our team members. We've always seen that the success of our business has been due to our team members. So everything we can do to make them happy and fulfilled in their work, that's, that, that creates an upward spiral of prosperity for our business as well. Last question on this topic, uh, John. The, I was challenged in my thinking in a lot of ways reading the book, but the first and most important one was, are my mission and vision statement good enough? Nope, they don't elevate to the level of a higher purpose. What advice would you have to any business owner in articulating a good higher purpose for their business? It starts with their value creation. What value are they creating? Why do they exist? For the world. They, why are they, what type of value are they creating? And then every business, I mean, there are some businesses that you could say have more negative effects than positive effects, perhaps maybe, say, the tobacco companies, perhaps. Uh, but in general, businesses are, are all creating value for people. And, and, and so the higher purpose is recognizing that value creation can, can linking it to a more transcendent virtue that they're part of. So say Whole Foods' higher purpose is to nourish people on the planet. Well, nourish is a good word because there's so many different levels we can nourish people. We can nourish them with healthy food. We can nourish them with the environment that we create in our stores so they're beautiful. We can nourish our team members. We can nourish all of our suppliers. Uh, people, so it's all the different stakeholders, not just your customers. They're all people too. And uh, the planet? The planet is partly the great environment that we're all part of, but it also represents every country, every race, every, every human, every species. Um, and so our, we exist to help try to nourish things. Nourish is good. Mm -hmm. We all can be a force for good on this planet. And you should tie your purpose to some type of value creation that's doing good in the world or get out of your business. Right. Your, your employees, your customers, your suppliers, they all need that from you as well. Yes. And, you know, part of that, if you're the entrepreneur, I always say the entrepreneur is usually on fire. All the entrepreneurs that I know are on fire about something. They're passionate about something. There's something they want to accomplish. I mean, 
when you read the biographies of Stephen Jobs or Bill Gates, these guys, uh, uh, or uh, Phil Knight at Nike, one of my favorite books is Shoe Dog, um, they were so passionate about what they were trying to do and accomplish that, that you're just swept along with their enthusiasm. But it, they don't oftentimes make it explicit. Mm. And being conscious means taking what they feel in their heart and soul intuitively and being able to put that into words so that other people will understand it. So the Nikes said their, their higher purpose is set in their slogan. They don't switch slogans. They have one slogan because it's their purpose, just do it. Do it. Yep. Exactly, it's a great higher purpose because it ha it's a call to action. It means get on with it, quit procrastinating. And, um, and if you read Phil Knight's book, you see that's the way Phil Knight was himself. He was just, his higher purpose is so linked to his own, who he is as a human being. And that's true for every entrepreneur. Yeah. Every entrepreneur is passionate. You just have to be more conscious about what that passion is and then make it into, into a purpose that other people will inspire them and they'll resonate with it. As you were saying that, John, what was going through my head is, wow, that's probably also, those first couple points, probably also the best advice for parents. You know, in particular, as a parent of three kids, I've learned the hard way that my kids tune out what I say to them, but they soak up everything that my wife and I do as parents. And that's really what they're learning from. It's, it's the behavior. Exactly. It's not the, the instruction or the words or the guidance. It made me think as a parent, um, have I ever really articulated to my kids what our higher purpose is as a family? That is so brilliant, yes. Exactly. And the answer is no. No, and because no, almost, no, no, almost no one does that. And yeah, that's and such the, a great idea. And the kids don't act as if they believe they have a role to play, an essential role to play, in the higher purpose of our family, because we haven't articulated what that higher purpose Brent, is. Articulate it for us now. What's the higher purpose of your family? Oh, God. It's, um, it's to love one another and help each other live our best possible lives. Wow, that's great. I need to, I'm gonna to have to soak on this because I, like I said, that, that just came first to mind. I'm not sure that's the so, best and right answer, but. So you're gonna, are you gonna articulate that to your kids? Yeah, I, I've, I've got to talk to my wife and maybe Better we Better check the same in with the boss different... first, that's for sure. Totally, but I'm, I'm inspired <laughs> to do this. I mean, what, to be at this point, you know, our boys are 15, our daughter's 11. Uh, you know, what could it mean to actually be clear as parents? Here's a higher purpose so that they actually see. There's one risk in doing that. Your kids are gonna watch everything you do yeah. and any inconsistency you have with that higher purpose, they're gonna call you on it. So they're, they're, that's, that's, this means you're just, uh, uh, as you say, it's not what you say, it's what you do. That so you articulate point. the higher purpose, but then you have to live it. And if you don't, it won't mean as much to the kids, right? Great. All four of those points have to hang together. John, this has been one of the most enjoyable conversations I've had in a long time. Thank you for sharing your story, your insights, your wisdom. Um, it's been wonderful for everybody who participates in the Make It Big conference, I hope. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Brent. It's been my pleasure as well. I wish you the very best. Awesome. In conclusion, thanks everybody for listening in on this, our Make It Big 2022 keynote with John Mackey, the co-founder of Whole Foods Market. I hope you've enjoyed it. I sure did. Many more great sessions to listen in on, and I hope you'll join more. Thanks. <music>